Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's Power Brew. I'm Libby Trosco of the Business Training and Services area at Carroll Community College. And with me today as a guest moderator is Chet Andes. Good morning, everyone. Happy to be here. And we're happy to have you, Chet. Um, today's Power Brew um, is going to be um, presented by uh, my normal guest moderators, Anya Han. Um, and so uh, we're looking forward to hearing from her in just a minute. In case you're missing her, she usually appears on this screen. So um, before we get started, I have a couple of items that I just want to cover with you. Um, if you're not familiar with business training and services at Carroll Community College, uh, we're an area of the college that helps local businesses um, grow and improve their workplace productivity and processes. Um, and so uh, on the screen here, you can see there are some areas um, that we specialize in. Well, one of them, of course, is employee training. So if your employees have training needs in any area, really from soft skills, management training, customer service, to technical skills, IT training, and manufacturing skills like welding. Um, business training and services can assist in this area. Uh, we also provide some services that you may or may not be aware of, so I just want to highlight those for one second. Uh, we can assist with your technology planning. Um, and that's the topic of today's um, Power Brew, so technology may be on your mind. So if you're really not sure about the direction of your organization and the technology, uh, we can assist with that. We also have um, workplace assessments. We can assess the effectiveness of your managers as well as the satisfaction level of, of your employees. So just keep in mind that today's webinar is brought to you today by Business Training and Services at Carroll, and uh, we're happy to assist your businesses in any way that we can. So just some housekeeping items to go over quickly before we get started with today's Power Brew. Um, you are um, unmuted. Everyone is unmuted at this time. Um, but we would invite you to submit questions, and you can do so by uh, using the control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. So you may see that there is a red-orange arrow to the right-hand side of your screen. You can expand and color collapse that control panel throughout the presentation and um, you can submit questions down uh, near the bottom or center bottom of that screen. We will answer questions throughout the session as we are able and we will allow time at the end. Um, and if there are any questions that we do not get to by the end of the Power Brew, uh, we will answer those questions via email and share out with all of the attendees of today's webinar. So today's Power Brew is brought to you, um, or presented by, I should say, uh, Sonia Han. And Sonia, I have the pleasure of working with Sonia, and she is the Director of Business Training and Services here at Carroll Community College. Um, she has numerous years' experience in the technology area, consulting with businesses, um, and also uh, had her own company at one time where she um, consulted with businesses, helped them with their technology, um, their website marketing needs. Um, she is a uh, graduate from the MBA program at Johns Hopkins University. Um, she lives right here in Carroll County in Tawnytown area with her husband and her three children. Um, and she really knows Carroll County and works with Carroll County businesses um, to help them be successful. So she's going to share her expertise in this topic with us today, and we're very excited to have her. Good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, we're going to be talking about uh, moving technology from more of a support role, where it's kind of traditionally been, to uh, more of a critical role in aiding important decision making. So traditionally, the uh, company's technology functions have been limited to, you know, infrastructure, security, um, software, and uh, software is mostly in support of business office functions. I'm a technologist who made the transition to management and business leadership, and in my role as a consultant with PricewaterhouseCoopers, as an entrepreneur when I was working on my, with my own business, and in my role at the college. I've met with hundreds of executives, principals, and their technology leaders. And what's been interesting um, over the years of doing that is that while I hear both executives and IT 
express the desire to expand technology beyond these traditional borders. Um, I also acknowledge and have seen the significant gap um, that really needs to be overcome before we can we can uh, really move forward. So in order to realize the strategic benefits of technology, it's really critical to rethink technology. And that means thinking about it in terms of thought leadership, thinking about it in terms of engagement and decision making. So if we take a look at um, what the benefits are of elevating technology and the discussions about technology to more of a, a senior level um, perspective, then you know, we look at that pr the process and what those benefits can be. You know, we think about the fact that first off, every organization is based on business processes. Business processes um, are what, what make the organization run on a daily basis, right? And technology's role is to form and manage those processes, right? So that's what technology has traditionally done. It's helped assist, um, make processes more efficient, make processes speedier. And so at this point, this is where um, technology comes in and it creates information or it creates data. Now, it, without elevating the conversation about technology to a higher level, this is where the process stops and we have a cyclical process, okay? We've got business processes, technology supports those business processes, that information flows back into the business processes, and we keep going around and around. However, if instead we have um, some discussions where technology, the information, um, you know, we ask ourselves at this point, at the technology level, how is technology being used? Um, is it simply supporting the business operations? If so, then this is, like I said, where it ends. Um, if, however, IT planning has been aligned with the business strategy, right, and if it has been aligned with the business strategy, then technology will be collecting and managing data that's really critical to the strategy of the business, to the organization. It will be providing mobility, it will be engaging customers in ways that produce strategically critical information that needs to be investigated. So if that's the case, then we're able to move on to the third step, which is intelligence. So if technology is helping, is supporting us um, and providing really critical data that's being able to move forward, information that's going to um, uh, provide the basis for um, meeting business mission and the business um, and and reaching those business goals as we go forward. Then um, you know that data can move on to the on to the next step. Now I know a lot of you have probably seen this. Um, it's kind of you know we talk a lot about big data. We talk about how big data can um, you know how uh, much it can help us in terms of business intelligence. But so often the big data gets stuck here. Right? So we bring this big data in and it gets stuck here at the step three, this intelligence level. Big data goes into a big database. And that database just grows and grows and grows and nobody really knows what to do with all that data. So this is kind of the second, this, yellow, this third box here, this is the second time when raising technology um, to a higher level becomes critically important. Because at this point, okay, we're collecting the data we need, but what do we do with it? We need to apply, we need to apply the intelligence. We need to um, do something with the tools and with that information. So basically what it is, is it's applying that senior level um, eye over the data, over the, the highlights, and, um, and seeing then, oh, look at this, this has really gleaned some insights into our business, and what can we do with that? Um, if, however, that doesn't take place, this is where we get stuck, right, with that big database, and it's just growing and growing, and we're just collecting that data and doing nothing with it. But with the um, application of um, senior you know, management and um, more uh, forward thinking, more long view thinking, then we're able to move on to the fourth step here, which is improvements, right? And at this step, um, an insight into the strategy provides a new level of understanding and creates ongoing incremental changes and improvements. And with that, um, we then be able, start to be able to see um, these continuous process improvements which drive efficiency, drive effectiveness, they drive the market, they drive the demand, and that's where we start to see the real um, increase in return on investment. So I'll be referring back to this model, this kind of five-step model that I just mentioned um, as we go throughout the presentation. 
So let's look for a moment at um, the different technology roles. And uh, then, and then, when I say then, what I mean is I mean back, you know, like the 2000s, let's say, um, and now being, you know, today, 2016, um, and in the near future. So one of the things that's different between um, the then and the now when it comes to technology is the goal of technology. And those of you uh, um, who've been around, <clears throat> pardon me, those of you who've been around for a while, you've seen this yourself. You've certainly seen this. You think about what technology was like in the 2000s and what the goal of that technology was. And it was basically to support business functions. It was supporting the organization. It was um, about all about increased efficiency. It was about decreased risk. Um, you know, it was about uh, faster product to market, right? But now the difference is that the focus needs to be on delivering value to the customer. So in order to deliver value to the customer, this is where that technology strategy has to be aligned with the business strategy. Okay, it's going to make all the difference. There's no way that we can focus our technology efforts on delivering value to the customer without that being in place. So, you know, we've got big data, we've got, you know, buzzwords business intelligence, we've got cloud computing, we've got social media, all those tools out there. And their focus is really about delivering that value to customers. Um, some of the resources, actually, let me give you, let me give you an example, um, kind of a, uh, uh, retail example here if we look at if we look at this so let's think about um, a retail uh, company right and maybe then in the 2000s this retail company was focused on putting in a new network infrastructure right putting in some new servers um, these servers were going to be faster they were going to be able to help the retail re retail stores um, manage their large inventories um, they were going to be able to be faster in processing sales we're going to be able to be faster in processing the inventory information um, and replenishing the shelves and um, this new servers also were going to be um, bigger and better and be able to assist with data backups Right, the larger the stores were getting, the more data they were accumulating. They were concerned about backup and recovery. So that is what we're looking at in terms of you know those goals being supporting the organization. That's kind of what those projects usually looked like in the 2000s, supporting the organization. The focus was on um, capital assets. We were spending a lot of money on infrastructure, spending a lot of money on servers, and um, that's kind of where we were. But today, think about the retail organization. Think about how many of you might have walked into um, a Mac store before. If you've ever walked into one, you know that you are approached by a um, customer service um, individual with an iPad in their hand, right? Now, this used to be very unusual. It's not so unusual anymore. I've gone to a number of stores now where I've been approached with somebody who's got a tablet in their hand. And um, what they're doing is, you know, they're walking, they're coming to the customer. Um, the implementation of tablet checkout these days basically means the retailer comes to you, they gather the um, information about the customer right there on the tablet. They're able to gather more information. They're able to take the customer order right there on the tablet. Um, uh, Grab, gather the customer's email address, for instance, which means the customer is going to get information like coupons and special events. They're going to be able to email the receipt directly to the customer rather than giving them a paper receipt. So all of this benefits the customer. Of course, it also benefits the business, right? But it benefits the customer. It all um, is in an effort to deliver value. And no longer are we talking about massive capital asset investments. Um, there's some cost savings sometimes, but we're more focused on the resources in terms of intellectual capital, what information can we gather about our customers to be able to use in terms of marketing and promotions, in terms of product improvement, and um, the generation of revenue. So there's also some differences in terms of the size of the projects and kind of the project life cycle, right? We've got, um, back then, it took months to make an investment decision regarding a project. Um, the large, the size of the projects were typically pretty large, right? Um, and the average time to value realization was um, two or more years, in some cases, many more years. Whereas now, the projects tend to be pretty small and continuous, and it just takes a few months to realize the value of those. Sonia, can I ask you a question real quick? Sure. Um, so can you give us an example of a project uh, in, in another field, maybe other than uh, retail, for then and now in terms of project uh, scope and duration? Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
So we can think about the financial industry. Everybody's gotten a chip card probably in the last nine months or a year, right? Um, and we're all in the U.S. still getting used to our chip cards, right? Um, it was funny because I took a trip to Europe just before the um, – and they were using chip cards over there and didn't know what to do with my regular slide card. I got home from my trip last summer and there was my chip card in the mail <laughs> for the first time, right? So they've been using them for a long time. But in the U.S., we're all getting used to our chip cards. Um, but in just a few more years, actually, MasterCard's currently working on a project where um, they are going to be having um, what they call, what they're calling right now, loosely, selfie scans um, to be able to check out so that you could be in the checkout standing there holding your phone and you know how um, iPhones, anybody who's got an iPhone or seen anybody with an iPhone, they know that there's the fingerprint recognition now, and that's worked really well for iPhone. So we're talking about multiple biometric um, uh, identifiers at this point, and MasterCard's working on this where you'd hold the phone up, take a selfie of yourself using your fingerprint, and the biometric data uh, face recognition software would identify your face, identify your fingerprint, and then um, it would essentially identify that this, yes, this is who they say they are and the transaction would be process, processed. So you can imagine, like once the software is built, right, and it's been tested and it's out there for general use, think about how um, rapidly others in related fields will be able to pick up this technology and go with it. So we're looking at, you know, because it's basically just going to be, every, the customers already have the phones. Right, so um, that's already—it's already in the hands of all the customers. Or all, you know, depending on who the customer base is. So it's really—we're just looking at you know a decision that could be made in a short period of time, be able to see the long-term you know future how it's going to give value to the customers. Um, it's a small, fairly small project. You know, we're not talking about um, something that's going to take you know many years to implement, and we're not talking about something that's going to take many years to realize any kind of a um, value out of it. It would be a quick turnaround. So, so I think that's, a, um, that's an example and something interesting to kind of keep an eye on coming up just in terms of our own lives at home as well as with regard to your businesses. All right, so in terms of relating to some of the changes also, I wanted to take, so I know we've got some people um, who are um, on the webinar who are technologists themselves, but we also have, I think, mostly people who aren't, right? So I wanted to be able to talk to, um, not just talk about how technology has changed in the business, in the workplace, but take something that could be a little bit more, um, you know, maybe is a little closer to home. So talk about how technologies have changed at home um, in order to be able to relate to some of the things we're going to be discussing. So if we look at, um, again, you know, let's say 30 years ago or so, 30 to 40 years ago, and we look at what technology was all about in the home. We think about things like calculators. You know, those of you who are old enough, like me, to be able to think back on this, right? We're thinking about calculators. We're talking about word processors even before we had computers, right? We were, ooh, wow, I moved from the typewriter to the, to the word processor, right? We're talking about the word processors. We're talking about then the first personal computers and printers. Basically, they were all there for efficiency's sake. It was to help us get our work done faster, and it was to help us, um, you know, uh, be more accurate as well, to assist us with our um, accuracy. Then we moved into this kind of a communication stage. We were all about communications, and um, we were thinking about beepers. I mean, I had my first, I remember when I was pregnant with my first baby and the hospital gave um, my husband a beeper and that's how I let him know that I was in labor, right? I contacted him on the beeper and then had him call me on the landline. Um, beepers, uh, cell phones, you know, nice big boxy cell phones in the beginning, right? Um, we, you know, emails, it was all about keeping in touch with others. Um, communication and relay of information. Um, then we moved into this sort of organization and kind of resource management sort of area. And we can remember it was the era of PDAs, Palm Pilots, and Blackberries, right? Are you a Palm Pilot person or a Blackberry person? Um, it was about managing our time. We had electronic calendars, to-do lists, um, and it was also about identifying resources through the Internet at that point. And now we've gotten into this realm of intelligence, right? Intelligent decision making. Um, how many of you out there have a Fitbit? or somebody in your family has a Fitbit. Um, I bet it's 
over half of you, I'm sure. Um, you know, we've got smart homes. We have thermostats that learn, learning thermostats. We have um, smart dishwashers that detect how much debris is on the dishes and then determine what wash cycle is going to be best to be able to clean those dishes and be most efficient. We've got financial applications. And there's all kinds of things for us to be able to use at home that's in this intelligent realm, right? Um, actually, I handle finances for my family. I don't know how you guys break that up, but I handle most of the finances in my family. And two or three years ago, I was um, using this really detailed, color-coded, um, really cool spreadsheet to track our budgeting and our um, investments and et cetera that um, had its origins in, oh, about 1995, I started that spreadsheet. <laughs> So I go through numerous iterations, right? Um, yeah, so for basically for about 20 years, I've been using the same upgraded version of a spreadsheet. Um, the same tool, same technology for household finances, and I'm a techie, right? Um, my head was basically stuck in that efficiency area, right, in that efficiency realm. Um, forget communications, you know, like downloading the information from my bank. Uh, yeah, tried that when it was new, and I didn't like it because it didn't organize it the way I wanted it to be organized. Um, forget the communi the organization um, era, you know, finance management software. I tried that too, and it didn't stick for me. Um, don't even ask me about the intelligence. At this point, I just felt like I had too many resources devoted, too much time and energy dedicated to my, you know, tweaking of that spreadsheet. Um, too many years, I knew the spreadsheet inside and out, it had my macros, it's got my down, drop downs, I was really attached to it, and so um, it would take too much time and energy, I felt, to switch. So my point is this, intuitively, we all know everything I've just talked about in the last few slides. We know the benefits of technology. We know that it's going to make our lives better, it's going to make our businesses better. We understand um, some of the intelligent um, you know, uh, applications of technology out there. But um, the hard part is understanding the barriers and getting past them and into the realm of results. So even, you know, I fully understand this, but there's still these barriers, right? In our businesses, our businesses, our executives, our board members, they understand this, but there are barriers to actually getting us from point A to point Z, right? So let's examine those for a minute. And um, we're going to look just a little bit at mindsets and um, consequences of those mindsets. So today, executives are on board theoretically, but that doesn't still mean, as I just said, that there aren't major barriers, particularly certain perceptions and misunderstandings that are creating a gap. Um, it's these mindsets that keep us moving from steps four and five in that, um, in that diagram I showed you earlier. So some of the mindsets are, you know, I don't understand, Technology, I don't need to understand technology. Think about your senior level management. Um, IT knows this stuff. That's, that's their wheelhouse. So I just want them to go off and make a decision and then um, just come provide the recommendation to us, right? Um, some people believe that the discussions are just too complex. They take too long. We don't have time for this. We don't ha have time to discuss this or to get to really understand the issues. Um, a lot of uh, executives may not say this, but they feel like you know they're shoveling money into technology, constantly spending money on technology, but we never see revenue come out of the technology department, right? That's not where revenue comes from. So whether consciously or subconsciously, they're feeling like they're putting money in and money is never coming back out. Um, and then of course, there's also you know, the fact that a lot of organizations are too busy fighting fires. They are worried about cybersecurity threats. Um, they're focused on aging infrastructures, um, old software, making those new software. So they're really busy with that. Um, the consequences, though, can be really significant. Um, number one, when IT comes back and makes a recommendation, and they've been going off, they've gone off and done it in a vacuum, that recommendation can be completely misaligned with business strategy, right? Because there was no input from senior management. Um, it could also come back and be completely unsupported, right? Because senior management hasn't been involved, they haven't been invested in that decision making at any level. Um, and, you know, I've got, uh, actually I had a really big um, uh, learning experience for myself. I was working with a big construction company, um, a regional construction company that works in Virginia, DC, Maryland, Pennsylvania. Um, and they needed, they were 
they need, were in need of a web-based solution that could be used in terms of on-the-site promotions. Um, they were do uh, large buildings, FBI buildings, all kinds of things, um, to record their contracts and sales and interface with their other uh, systems, like their financial and accounting systems. So um, I had the blessing of the president to work with the VP with the vice president, um, to work with IT and also with the users. Basically, um, the VP and I were in there talking to the president, and the president said, I mean, almost word for word, like, I don't understand technology. I don't get it. I don't care to get it. The VP knows a little bit more about this. You know, um, he wasn't really strong in it, but he knew a little bit more about that. He said, you know, you guys, I trust you guys. I'm going to give you all the resources you need to determine a solution. I'll give you the golden key to open any doors you need to open. So that's great, right? That sounds great. Like, yeah, all right, right? Well, we get in there, work for six to nine months, you know, talking to the users, doing all this work, um, you know, uh, pulling users, getting input, getting, you know, input from the people who are going to be um, out on the, on the, um, out and on site and using these um, resources, talking to IT, everybody's involved, right? The big day comes, the VP and I walk into the president's office, and we sit down and we pre present our solution to the president. Right? You know, this is great. We've come up with this great solution, and this is what we're going to do. And we literally get just a few sentences into our proposal, into the meat of our proposal, and he starts shaking his head. We're like, you know, what's going on? Well, guess what? He, we were completely misaligned with um, his business strategy because he hadn't conveyed it. He'd, over the last six to nine months, come up with a new strategy about where he wanted the business to go, some, you know, new direction, and it hadn't been conveyed to us, but, you know, that's, I mean, I, that was a, a product of us not communicating throughout this process. Um, and in addition, he didn't understand. You know, he started saying, well, what about this? What about this? Well, we had considered that six or nine months ago and gone through, okay, let's research this. Is this the way to go? And, oh, no, this is not the, re this is the reason why we're not going to go there, right? But he didn't have any of that knowledge because he hadn't been involved in the process. So, you know, it's really, really critical um, that at some level that we have that, that buy-in and that involvement, right, to be able to close the gap. So we're going to talk specifically about um, five different tactics. Um, there are lots more, there are lots of different ways to go about doing this and, and trying to close the gap, but we're going to talk specifically about five different um, tactics today that um, can help get you started. The first one is venturing outside the comfort zone, right? Remember me and my spreadsheet? I was in the comfort zone. <laughs> so, um, you know, technology infrastructures quickly becoming very commoditized. Um, we've got software as a service, we've got cloud technology, managed infrastructure services. Um, essentially every agency, whether it's big or small, can pretty much create a solid high performance technology platform pretty simply these days. It doesn't, you know, doesn't cost a lot of money, doesn't take a lot of time once that's in place. Um, once that's in place, there's, there's some fine tuning that needs to be done. Most organizations take some time to do that. So their IT department will, will fine tune um, customize a little bit here and there. But then, you know, once fine-tuned, for the most part, the question becomes, you know, what do we, what do, we do now? Do I stay in my comfort zone um, and continually kind of tune the machine, tweak the machine? Or do I take technology to the next level? And um, this is where venturing outside the comfort zone is really important. So, Everybody needs to commit to taking technology to the next level, right? Um, get those, you know, you, you basically got a lot of that, the basics down, and now we've got to take it to the next level and deliver that value that we talked about to the customers um, and, and, and see some revenue um, increases because of it too. So, you know, another question that comes is, is there, is there a seat at the table for the IT manager? Okay, and what I mean by that is so often I have heard over and over and over again, my IT, per, IT person, you know, he or she's great with networks, they're great with, you know, understanding the systems, but they're just not strategic. So, um, you know, I just don't feel that they'd really fit or it, they'd really get anything out of sitting at the table when there are strategic discussions going on. And... Um, and that may or may not be true about that individual, but certainly without the opportunity to grow in that area, um, you're never going to find out, 
right? You've got to bring them to the table. So having a seat at that table is really critically important and then encouraging their participation. Um, and of course, the other people that they're sitting at the table with need to be open to that. So that's part of that process as well. Um, and then, you know, another question is, you know, from the, that's from the technologist perspective, but from the strategist perspective, does that strategist, does that executive have a solid grasp of the technology? Now, I've, you see here, I've got um, that the technologist needs to understand strategy. Does the technologist need to be, you know, the person pushing the strategy? No but they need to have a grasp of the strategy. And the strategist has to understand technology. They don't need to be a techie, but they've got to understand it. They've got to have a grasp of it so that we can help to bridge this gap. So, but this is a comfort zone. Our techies feel comfortable in the tech world and our strategists and our executive management feel comfortable in the executive management world. But this is one of those ways that we've really got to, um, got to bridge that gap. I actually worked for um, GE for a number of years or as, a, as a consultant. And during that time, I was working with one of the many divisions. Um, the company had identified some really significant advances in technology that it felt were going to help get them um, to the next level. They really felt like it was going to assist them. It was really central to their long-term business strategy. Um, the changes involved a huge investment at this time, um, multi-million dollar investment and a vast rework of their business processes, as well as some in significant infrastructure processes. Um, but once the new technology was up and running, uh, it was expected to make, um, bring a lot of value to the company. And in fact, it actually did when, once it was implemented. But as such, because it affected the business processes, it was that much more critical that this technology product, project, pardon me, this technology project have buy-in of senior management in all areas, in marketing, in HR, you know, in finance, and in all areas of the organization. So um, at the time, they had a really strong CIO in place, um, and she was, you know, a, she was great. She had the technology background. Um, she had the, you know, she was a strategic thinker. She was a long-term thinker. So she and I worked together, and we actually. Um, put, we, we realized that there was a problem. She realized that there was a problem, um, that most of senior management didn't understand technology enough to really support it. They knew their areas really well, but not enough to really support this, this particular project. So what we did is we actually planned a full day kind of a boot camp. And it was a full day. You can't imagine how hard it was to get these executives together in a room for a full day here. But, but we did it. We were able to pull it off. And it was all about, um, you know, not the nitty gritty stuff, but about how the technology worked and why their cooperation and coordination and buy-in was going to be so important for various different levels to be able to understand how that worked. And it really made all the difference in a successful implementation. So the second tactic, um, is sponsoring industry technology reviews. So this is another method that's being used um, in a lot of uh, you know Fortune 500s and and um, you know and startups too that are just really taking off. And um, whether or not you're a company that's about in uh, excuse me about technology, let's assume that you're a, a, a in an industry that's not the tech the tech industry, right? Um, we're talking about sponsoring periodic reviews of technology's long-term role in the industry. So engage in kind of forward-looking conversations about how technology affects the industry and what the implications are for your business specifically. Um, some companies have a CIO or another senior executive who can facilitate these discussions, but those who don't and might prefer an outside view um, can involve, inter uh, involve external experts who can help generate those discussions right, um, a consultant or some other external um, expert. Given the rapid rate of change, such big picture discussions should really take place every like 12 to 18 months or more frequently, depending on your business goals and depending on how technology relates with your business. Um, there's a really, I think, a really neat technology that's going to be coming out. We've all heard about the Internet of Things, and some of you may have heard about using beacons. Um, there's a new technology that's being worked on right now that's called um, ambient proximity. I don't know if you've heard of it, but basically beacons, um, what we're looking at for the future is, you know, when, an, when a customer walks into, let's say I walk into a shoe store, and I've got my cell phone on me, because who doesn't? Right? Who doesn't have their mobile phone on them when they, when they walk around and go shopping? Right? So um, there would be beacons placed on displays, like for instance on a, a shoe display. Right? And as I approach that display, um, it would be able to ping my phone and 
uh, have a specific in, a specific identifier associated with my phone at that point, and um, and there's other technology behind it. But basically, it would be able to monitor and see how many customers stopped to look at that particular running shoe, for instance. It would be able to determine how many stop and put the shoe on or how many skip the shoe altogether after they stop and look at it. It would be able to, um, that data then could be compared to information on what the customer actually purchases to provide real-time information back to the brand, right? So back to Nike or whoever it is. Um, in fact, JFK is currently piloting, if anybody goes through JFK, JFK is actually currently piloting a similar technology where they've got beacons placed throughout the um, airport and they're pinging the phones to be able to determine how long the lines are taking. We've all heard about horrible um, lines and traffic jams and things at the airports, right? So it's actually um, using that right now. So if you go through JFK, that's actually happening right now. So these industry technology reviews really help you keep up to date on you know, what's being piloted right now, what's up and coming, and how can that, you know, I may not be a shoe manufacturer, but how can this technology potentially be used, you know, if, if that's my industry, if manufacturing that's my industry, um, if I'm manufacturing consumer products, that I could see how this technology might be used. And it's going to help us think long term. So another tactic that we, you can use is holding a technology, sort of a state of the union address, we could call it. Um, and basically, this would be, um, maybe an annual address provided to the board of directors specifically, okay? And it would be given by, um, you know, by the CIO and uh, any business unit managers that were perhaps critically involved. Um, or, uh, you know, if you've got a data um, uh, uh, CDO or whatever, whatever that position is called within your organization. And at that point, that would be, this would be more specifically about your organization. What's the state of technology in your organization today, right? So it would be going over, you know, um, what are the current IT capabilities? What are the ongoing projects? What, what's underway right now? What's about to come up? What are some of the issues? And what are some of the opportunities, too? Um, it would also be a time to be able to discuss uh, IT talent. Um, are there talent gaps? that when we talk strategically about the business, right, and we say this is where the business wants to go, do we have any gaps in, techno in our technology group um, where we don't have the ability to get us from here to there when it comes to technology? Um, or perhaps we've got some special talent already in-house that's really not being leveraged, and um, maybe those, you know, some things need to be reallocated there so that that talent that's already in-house can be appropriately used and put to best use to, being, to bring that um, value to the customer and ultimately um, to the business as well. And then there's also, um, you know, there needs to be consideration of the, you know, the win the lottery scenario, right? What happens if the CIO, if your CIO wins the lottery? So we've got to talk about some succession planning too. Um, and that's important from the board's perspective. You know, the board's not really developing strategy or uh, pushing strategy, but they need to be aware of kind of where things are so that they have that full big picture, um, big picture perspective. And also because it has been shown over and over and over again that the number one factor, most important factor in the success of a technology project is um, IT, uh, excuse me, is executive sponsorship, is a strong executive sponsorship, so. Oh, we've got a question. <laughs> so, Sonia, I might be stating the obvious here, but you're, you're stressing the importance of the um, having someone at the senior level understand technology, then you're also talking about the CIO, Chief Information Officer, and then also I noticed um, on the poll that we did before the webinar started, 100% of the respondents said that their organization does not have an IT expert. So I I'm just, this might be a rhetorical question, this might just be uh, um, just for clarification, but it sounds like it, that since IT is touching every facet of the business today, it's no longer just a productivity support. It, it's really for marketing. It's for you know that intelligence you're talking about. It sounds like those are critical things to have. Uh, someone at the executive level, someone on the board um, at, that at least understands technology, if not is a representation of the technology sector so that they can really interpret things for the board and make sure that the strategies 
um, well aligned with the IT. Yes, absolutely. You're absolutely right. Um, in fact, that's that brings us right to, it's a perfect introduction, for um, uh, the next tactic, which is ensuring strong techni um, technology representation, because you're right, it's absolutely critical that there be, um, you know, ideally, especially, you know, as you said, the poll results were interesting because they did say that um, no, nobody who responded said that there's, um, there's anybody, you know, uh, at that higher level who has that technology expertise and, and can take that on that role. And that is really critical. Um, there's a number of reasons why. Um, primarily, you know, one of the reasons why is because we need somebody there who it's just, you know, in their mind. I mean, technology is not necessarily in the forefront of all of these other, you know, executives' minds. Um, but not only that it's in the forefront of their mind to bring up topics for discussion or to insert information about technology into the conversations, but also because that leader helps to facilitate understanding among all of the other um, individuals at the table, right? And, um, you know, so the tactic here is to ensure strong technology representation. And really, there should be um, at least one person at your, um, at your executive level, and at least one person on the board, and that's really a minimum, okay? Um, so if you feel that your organization isn't that greatly impacted by technology, we know they all are, but, you know, isn't one of those which technology is really the core, then at a minimum, you ought to have one person on the board and one person on your executive team. And what we're looking for with these individuals, and you can bring on more people over time, too, um, but we're looking at um, functional you know, not somebody with pure, purely only with functional expertise, because that alone may not help boards um, or executives reap the full benefits. Instead, we're also looking for somebody who's got uh, leadership skills, strong leadership skills, has got business knowledge that's really integral to helping um, other directors understand the connection between technology and the business. And one of the greatest advantages of having that expert, that technology or digital expert, is that he or she can help educate the rest of the board, as I mentioned before. Um, a recent report actually found that 20% of current boards today are actively looking for directors who have this profile, right? who have this, the technology background, but the leadership and the, and the business knowledge as well. So it's, people are realizing, and, and we got to remember that a lot of boards already have these people on there. So if 20% of the boards are looking for that, you know, and, you know, probably half of them, you know, have that individual already, then, you know, we're really seeing the importance of that. Um, over the last year, I've actually been working with an educational institution to develop and implement a comprehensive strategic technology plan. And when we got started, no one in the administration, um, and no one on their board either for that matter, had a strong understanding of technology. I, honestly, I, they may have had a board member who had a decent um, understanding of technology, but there was a, there was a huge gap here in terms of um, understanding the issues and, and understanding what was available. Um, it was a really significant issue, and it was becoming more and more clear over time as we were um, starting this task to build this technology strategy uh, uh, that this was going to be this was going to be an issue. Um, the institution was trusting, you know, me and the experts that I was bringing in to assist with the development of the plan, but they really needed someone who understood the business processes and understood, you know, from the inside out and understood the fundamentals of the technology to be able to bridge these gaps, to be able to educate others and to be able to ensure the successful implementation of the plan after we were gone, right? Because there needs to be somebody, you've got to have that, um, you know, that person who's going who's gonna to take that and, and move on with it. Um, so they ended up finding a really perfect person. So it was great because she's got background in, um, she had a strong background in um, technology before she got into education, and then she was in education administration for a long time, and they brought her onto the board of directors. And I can tell you that it has made all the difference in the world. It's made, it's made a huge difference to be able to have that representative there um, in terms of, you know, certainly our interactions with her, but even to a much greater degree in terms of, um, you know, how she's been able to educate the other members of the board and the members of the administration. And the um, last tactic that I wanted to talk about is encouraging big picture thinking. So, you know, you'd think, well, with executives and you know, board of directors, why would we need to encourage big picture thinking? That's what they're all about. But we need to encourage big picture thinking when it comes to technology, right? So we can really help innovation from within the organization. And some of the ways to be able to do that are um, 
you know, but certainly by doing some of the things we've already talked about, some of the four previous tactics, having that, you know, having that expert there to, to open up discussions and insert um, comments and um, information, helpful information into conversations. But um, also, you know, promote outside the boardroom discussions um, focused on the long term. And, um, you know, in, in uh, one instance, um, actually, the uh, chairman of a board organized informal gatherings um, around, you know, at his house, around crackers and cheese, and you know, if your organization allows, you can have some wine, <laughs> depending on your business, right? Um, to talk about kind of the global economy, to talk about investing in innovation, and what the organization can be doing to, um, you know, to really push themselves and move forward and move out of that comfort zone. Um, technology budgets, when it comes to the board, or when you know those things, kinds of things are being discussed, they're really relatively in a lot of organizations, they're relatively small proportion of the overall budget. Um, some organizations are not. Um, so often the deliberation of what should be what you should be thinking about when it comes to spending in that area really doesn't come out in a board presentation. There's really not enough time to be talking about technology strategically. Um, and when it comes to senior management as well, you know, that's there so often again we get stuck in thinking about what's currently going on or firefighting or the next upgrades that we need to be making that we're not really thinking about it in the big picture. So this is, you know, opportunities like this are, are really um, very helpful. So we talked about five different tactics, right, to close the gap and to elevate discussions about technology to the higher level. Um, we talked about going outside the comfort zone. And that going outside the comfort zone is not just about the top level um, senior management. It's not just about the board. It's actually about our technologists as well. They need to go outside of their comfort zone and reach out and start to think about strategy, start to orient themselves to the business strategy, think about business processes, think about where the business wants to go, where they're heading. Um, we talked about sponsoring industry trend reviews, looking at what's new and upcoming, what's currently being piloted at other, um, you know, other places. Look at best practices um, in terms of, you know, what's new and upcoming and how this can be used in our own business. We talked about um, securing strong uh, technology representation, that CIO, um, that member of the board, and, um, and possibly others as well. We talked about holding a State of the Union, talking about specifically, um, you know, where are we today, um, and, you know, just to get people more oriented to the technology um, uh, issues and um, challenges and opportunities. And then we talked about um, thinking about technology in terms of more of the big picture. So the whole idea behind all of this, right, is going back to that, going back to that um, diagram that we talked about before. It's moving um, from the business processes. Business processes um, are formed and um, managed by the technology. If we've got people involved at the right level in that technology, then we know what kind of data we want to pull from those business processes. We know that when the customer comes in, we want to gather how long did they look at the shoe? Did they try the shoe on? Did they move on to something else? Did they purchase it? And then rather than just collecting that information and putting it in a big vat somewhere, you know, some deep, dark hole somewhere, right? Um, we then want to apply um, strategy and apply intelligence to that so we don't get stuck in this cycle. Right, and whoop, so we don't get stuck in that cycle, and um, then we can say, okay, now we've take this information, and what does this what what does this tell us? What does it tell us about how we can improve our products? Why did somebody move on from the shoe? Maybe they looked at the shoe for um, you know ten seconds, and then they moved on. They never tried it on. What was it? Was it sticker shock? Did they look at the shoe like the design? And they turned it over and they decided, oh, wait a second, that's too expensive for me. You know, a lot of us are using this kind of thing. We've been using this in terms of websites, right? Like you think about how long does somebody go onto a web page? Well, they go there for five seconds and then they jump off of it. Well, evidently they weren't finding what they wanted on that web page. So the same kind of, you know, intelligence needs to be applied in what we don't traditionally think of as a technology application. Right? We think about somebody walking up to that shoe display, and we don't typically think of that as a place for technology interaction to occur, but now it is. It is a place for the technology and, um, interaction to occur, and that's where the intelligence needs to be applied at that point. And then we can move into making, now that we've gathered that information, and it's applicable to our business processes, to our marketing, to our product design, to our pricing, then we can make those continuous improvements, and we can move on to, um, to better the organization and to move it on into 
you know, the next decade or more. Yes, Chet. Well, because I'm always thinking about education and training, uh, just because I'm an educator at heart, it sounds like with um, the first tactic they're getting out of the comfort zone in the State of the Union address for um, technology, can you speak to how training might be appropriate for either the executives, the IT department, and the employees um, to fill those gaps and speed implementation of those different projects? And it sounds like training might be appropriate for both um, specific IT needs and also helping folks understand strategy better. Can you speak to just how training might be a tool in those steps? Yes, absolutely. And it's even more important. Um, I mean, it's important, honestly, in any organization and uh, training can be applied, whether formally or informally. Um, but in those organizations that maybe don't have those, you know, those driving forces that, you know, somebody sitting on the board or somebody um, uh, in IT who already understands strategy, it's that much more important. Right. So, um, you know, training, um, uh, training absolutely just it's coming in whether we call it training or we call it a, de a briefing or we call it we come in, you know, somebody could come in and do um, assist or facilitate those state of the, um, you know, state of the union uh, addresses. Right. Um, I think one of the things to consider here is that um, that training would be or that that um, those addresses would be very customized, right? So again, remember that when we're dealing with the um, strategists and getting them to understand technology, we don't necessarily want somebody who is um, a technologist coming in and teaching them about technology. So the training would be more oriented to, you know what, as a, um, as a leader, this is what you need to understand about technology, and so it's very specialized. Um, and certainly, that would be that would be very, um, you know, very fruitful. So coming in and saying, you know, what as a strategist, here's what you need to understand. Because another thing is, leaders don't they don't have time. They don't want to sit there and learn about switches and you know and cabling and you know those kinds of things. They don't need to know about that, but they need to understand a certain level. And the same goes exactly for the IT people. And getting them to understand to think about getting the techies to think about what are the business processes involved here? How does what you do impact the business processes? And how does it impact ultimately the business and assisting the business to get to their strategic goals? Um, and that's really important because so often, you know, I mean, it's not quite like it was in the 2000s where we literally got our techies down in a basement, right, working in the lab somewhere. It's a little bit different, but um, so often they are kind of relegated to, you know, kind of a, a back office function where they're not really integrated with the rest of the business and don't really understand those strategic goals because it's, they're just not exposed to it. Okay. Thank you so much, Sonia. Um, we'd like to open it up to questions now. Um, so if you do have a question, uh, you can submit it using the control panel on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, and I just want to take a moment to uh, talk about our Power Brews. Um, the goal behind the Power Brews is to give um, free information to the business community. And it is our goal to arm you with information that you can use right away back in the workplace. Uh, so that's why we like to do them in the morning uh, while you have your caffeine and your, your, your mind's a sponge, so to speak, and you can uh, implement right uh, that day. Take some ideas back to your coworkers and, um, and if you're in a leadership position, to the leaders in your organization. Um, we have several power brews uh, that we have recorded, and so I want to make sure that you are aware that you can r uh, watch any pre-recorded power brew uh, at, uh, by visiting caroltraining.com backslash power brew. Um, we are working on um, continually updating those power brews, so the past few power brews, you can get some information out there if you have not um, attended one of our previous power brews. So um, we're about at our 10 o'clock hours, and I actually do not have any questions from the audience. So any parting thoughts anyone here? All okay. right. Well, I just want to say thank you very much um, for being on today's Power Brew. Uh, we really enjoyed. We had a good turnout today. Um, one other, there was one other little bit of data that I wanted to share um, from our polling earlier, and I, I meant to share it earlier, but I forgot to, which was when we asked the question about um, your top-level decision makers and how often 
they discuss technology issues. 50% um, of you, and I um, can't remember exactly how many we had, but I think we've got like 17 um, uh, folks on today, uh, close to, tw yeah, close to 20. Um, but 50% of you said that the top level decision makers infrequently discuss technology issues. And that's really, really saying something there. So I think, you know, the good thing about that is that there's lots of room for improvement, right? I always try to look on the bright side of things. There's a lots, lots of room for improvement um, and um, bridging that gap that we talked about today. So best of luck to all of you. Um, I think our uh, contact information is on there, and actually the Power Brew notes come out from me, so you can always um, respond. If you have additional questions, feel free to email us, and, um, and we'll get back with you. Everybody have a fantastic day.